Hello everyone, thank you for joining us. I'm Scott Montague from Coquitlam Search and Rescue and I'll be navigating the complex terrain of technology this evening. I've got some good news for you. If you stick around until the end of our session, you'll have a chance to get a grip, literally, from our sponsor, Hillsound. Your cameras and mics are off for this session, but we still wanna hear your comments and your questions. In fact, on your screen is a question mark button or a question box. Use it to post anything you want to tell us. Or you can ask a question and we'll either answer online or in the Q&A part of the presentation. Let's give it a try right now. Find that question area and maybe this is called a question box or whatever. And let me know where you're joining you from. So if you were joining from Portland, Oregon, just type in Portland, Oregon. While you're doing that, to get us started, please welcome the Executive Director of Adventure Smart in BC, the crown, or is it the cornice, of SAR Prevention Education, none other than Sandra Riches. Thank you, Scott. I think I need to look for that crown. I haven't seen it around my office, so <laughs> thank you very much for that. I can't wait to be here again tonight. And, and our special guest this evening is what I've been describing this winter as our interest, industry cousins. Um, we were talking before we came on to join you this evening about ages and length of programs. And Avalanche Canada is the same age as BC Adventure Smart. And that's about 18 and a half years old. Uh, we all started around the same time, uh, the same way. It was through a new initiatives fund through Public Safety Canada. And here we are, fast forward to 2022, um, both advancing it in great ways with outreach and education curriculum all around outdoor safety and snow science on their side and our side uh, specifically about outdoor enthusiasts, preparedness and wise practices, all with the goal really of reducing incidents. And in our case, reducing the number and severity of search and rescue calls. Before I welcome my, my guest, um, I would just like to say I'm really grateful to be joining you tonight from the Squamish, Musqueam, and Tsleil-Waututh First Nations. Uh, I do recreate a lot on these lands and play and work and feel very honored to do so with, with friends and family and colleagues from search and rescue and throughout the outdoor rec industry. We're, we're quite fortunate to have such easy access to beautiful territories and, and have the opportunities to play and, and work here. Um, I'm grateful also to work closely with all of the search and rescue volunteers that we do have in the province. And what I'll describe to you in these first few slides, um, and if Zoe could uh, pull that up in between Scott and Zoe, they'll queue up the first few slides, which are mine, and then the stage is our guests. Um, and, and we have um, the safety series that we that we deliver every winter and summer now. This is really since COVID. It just gives us easy access to great great opportunities for all of us. I think we've all adapted quite well. And, and I work directly for the BC Search and Rescue Association. And this is our winter series. We're into our second webinar. The next one is this Thursday for Backcountry Snow Safety, if you want to come back. And then we'll have a little bit of a break for the holidays. And then we have a few more in the new year from January to March. Really fun, entertaining, educational, all about winter safety. Next slide, please. Our main focus with Adventure Smart and our messages, <clears throat> excuse me, no matter the program, how it's delivered, um, is to follow our three T's. Pardon me, I have a, a bit of a, a cold today. And we want you to trip plan, train, and take those essentials with you. And don't forget to add the season and sports specific gear. But this is the, the mainstay or the trifecta of our outdoor recreation safety message is we really need you to leave that information at home with a trusted emergency contact. Uh, make sure you have the training to do the activity you've chosen to do. That's physical training, certification-based, mentorship, uh, physical training, mental wellness. That list can goes on and that's continuous. We continue to train. And taking those essentials with you. There's a basic list like the foundation of your house. There's the foundation of your pack. And then you want to add season and sports specific gear, which I bet our guests will talk a little bit about tonight as well. But we cannot forget those three extra key pieces and I'll wait for Zoe to share that with you. Next slide, please. The app is an easy tool, a free tool to anyone in Canada who would like to 
have an easier means of filing that trip plan. If you're not really sure what's involved in filing a trip plan, letting people know where you're going, our app can help you do that. And it just allows you to fill in the fields and you can add as much detail as you like. And then you can send that to an emergency contact via email or text. And then if there is an emergency, you've made that, that, that protocol, that, that plan with your emergency contact for them to call 911 when they know you're not back by a certain time, they ask for police uh, and then that is transferred over to the police. The police are the tasking agency on every single search and rescue call in the province of BC and police or RCMP task out that local search and rescue group. So then that trip plan, your trip plan is transferred to the search and rescue volunteers. So if they know the area of the province you're in, the region, the mountain, the activity you're doing, the group you're with, your abilities, your skills, your gear, where's your car, um, that is like gold to them. So that's an easy tool to use and it's free of charge. Next. If there is an emergency, and in British Columbia, there are 2,000 search and rescue calls in British Columbia every single year that 3,000 search and rescue volunteers respond to, we, we, we need you to stop. That is critical. For whatever reason there is an emergency, by you stop moving helps your situation and that allows you to stop and figure out what the emergency was if you need to figure that out think about the area you're in and the emergency and your next steps observe that you're in a safe space and then create shelter and that you can create um, opportunities to look for dangers if there's a cornice overhead if you're too close to a tree well too close to an edge or a ledge or on a ridge these observations are critical and then you get to plan with the essentials in your pack and your training comes into application here and your risk assessment and management all folds in really, really well. So in any case of emergency, stop, think, observe and plan. Remember the number is 911 and there is no charge for search and rescue. Next. I'd like to take this opportunity to pass the stage over to Zoe. Zoe is a public avalanche forecaster and apprentice ski guide residing in beautiful, beautiful Revelstoke, BC. So we grew up in Calgary, Alberta, also another beautiful part of our country, and began her career as a ski patroller in the Canadian Rockies before migrating west to a deeper snowpack. That's not a bad reason to move west uh, and to warmer temperatures. That's also not a bad reason to move, <laughs> to move west. So we enjoy spending time in the mountains and sharing these experiences with other people around her. And we're so grateful to have Zoe here from Avalanche Canada, and uh, we look forward to your presentation, Zoe. Thanks for joining us. Awesome, thank you so much, Sandra, for that wonderful introduction, and I'm really happy to be here tonight. I'm also dealing with a little bit of a tickle in my throat, so I apologize if I do have to cough or clear my throat, but I'll try to keep things rolling today. So, Today I'm going to talk about a couple aspects of avalanche awareness with one key focus, which is recognizing avalanche terrain. If you are new to the backcountry, this is one of the most important things that you can learn to safely recreate in a winter mountain environment. So kudos for being here and for taking this first step. So I'm going to start by talking about who we are at Avalanche Canada. Simply put, the best way to describe what we do is that we are the voice of public avalanche safety in Canada. We're a non-governmental, non-for-profit organization. And here you can see a few things that are key that we work on. So our flagship product is the public avalanche forecast. Um, we also run avalanche awareness programs. We create curriculum for recreational avalanche courses like AST courses. We're a general point of contact for avalanche information, be it for media or other purposes like that. And we also support avalanche research at institutions such as Simon Fraser University. The bottom line is that our mission is to encourage and educate people to recreate safely in the winter backcountry. We want to inspire, engage, and empower recreationalists to enjoy the backcountry and to be safe from avalanches. So let's start really broad picture. What is an avalanche? An avalanche occurs when a mass of snow releases from a mountainside and tumbles down a slope. So this picture starts to give you an idea of the type of terrain that we might see avalanches from, as well as the potential consequences of even a relatively small avalanche. 
So here, um, I apologize if this video is lagging, but we can see a skier triggering a slab avalanche. Now there are different types of avalanches that we can characterize into either slab or loose snow, but slab avalanches, these are the real kicker. The majority of avalanche accidents or fatalities occur from slab avalanches. So these are the ones that are gonna be the most dangerous to you as a recreationalist. If we move on to the next slide here, we can see one of our field techs, Martina, and she is ski cutting a, what is called a loose wet avalanche. So loose avalanches being our other type of avalanche. Um, it may be hard to see if the video is lagging, but the deposit of this avalanche is moving quite a bit slower and they're easier to predict in terms of where they're gonna fail versus a slab avalanche that may occur on a slope adjacent to you or above you and is much faster moving and faster to propagate across a terrain feature and pull a significant amount of snow down with it. So those are our two types of avalanches. Now we're gonna get into what we need to form an avalanche. So although terrain recognition is gonna be the primary focus of tonight, it's really part of a bigger picture. Avalanche terrain really only gains significance when snow and triggers are included in the picture. With all three of these things combined, we then have the potential for avalanches. So let's start by talking about snow. The first thing that we'll need to grasp is that we need a threshold amount of snow to create an avalanche. So in our early season, this is around now, this is when we're thinking about, is there enough snow on the ground to create an avalanche? And that depends on a few factors. One of the most important factors being the ground roughness. So are there big boulders and lots of undulating terrain? Or are we talking about a smooth grass slope and a smooth rock slab, for example? We need at least enough snow on the ground to overcome that ground roughness to some degree to create a nice smooth surface for avalanches to run on. So this slide would be an example of not enough snow to reach a threshold where avalanches could could happen that are dangerous to humans so we can see that there is a little bit of snow on the ground but still lots of rocks and trees and boulders sticking out on the ground that is creating roughness on the ground but one thing i did want to point out with this slide if you look to the very back you can see the the ridge line the mountainous ridge line and it's possible that those slopes, which look quite a bit wider, are at the threshold for avalanches and have overcome that ground, thresh, ground roughness. Now, if we move to this picture, we can see a slope that has reached that sm sufficiently smooth surface to create avalanches. There is a little bit of rock poking out on this slope, so it's not completely smooth, but it's smooth enough that you could create a connected surface for an avalanche to occur. And you can bet that when the next snowfall lands on top of this surface, it would be game on for avalanches on this slope. Another concept to bring into this is the structure of the snowpack. And that's a pretty important piece. We're not gonna go too far into that tonight, other than introducing the idea that snowpack structure can either be stable, which is good, or it can be unstable, which is dangerous and weak. And then now we're into really what I think is the key part of tonight's talk, and that's terrain. It's all about learning how to recognize it. And I'm gonna put forward tonight that the most important terrain attribute or characteristic that you can understand is slope angle or incline. Slope angle can be hard to recognize without having a little bit of experience. Um, one easy uh, comparison would be to ski runs, where if you have your typical black to double black terrain, that's generally going to be avalanche terrain. If you have blue runs, that's probably unlikely to be avalanche terrain, the potential for the occasional avalanche slope. And if you have green runs, then you are primarily going to be out of avalanche terrain. But 
when you, one thing that you can do in the field is start measuring slope angle. And this is something that even as an avalanche professional, I do routinely when I'm out in the field. So I take my smartphone, you can easily get inclinometer apps, or you can even just get a manual inclinometer and make it a game with your friends. When you head out and you look at a slope, you should all take a guess at what the angle is and then bring out your phone and verify what it is. And if you do that over and over again, you're gonna get a really good eye for slope angle, which is gonna be imperative in helping you to interpret what is and is not avalanche terrain. So this photo is an example of a slope that would be too low angle for avalanches to occur. So the snow is held in place by gravity and it's, it's just simply not possible to get avalanches in this terrain. One thing I did want to point out though, is that it looks like this person is walking through kind of an opening in the trees. So another thing to consider is, I might not be in avalanche terrain right now, but what's above me? So if, if, if I'm in this opening, has that been created by avalanches coming down off the mountain into this more open area? So always consider that even if you are not at avalanche terrain yourself, what's above you and what avalanche terrain may be impacting you from where you are. So now we're looking at terrain that would be too steep for avalanches to occur. So the rock and ice on this cliff face, it's gonna continually be shedding snow and not have the ability to build up a slab or, or enough snow to create an avalanche. It is important to say that there's other hazards that come along with steep faces like this, such as like cornice fall from above, rock or ice fall, and, and just those natural sloughs. Those sloughs will be considered small, loose avalanches that generally wouldn't be enough to bury or injure you. But you can imagine that if you're an ice climber up on this steep wall in a precarious position, those would certainly be dangerous to you. So here's a quick graphic to put all of this into perspective. We can see that our most common angle for slab avalanches to occur is between 30 and 45 degrees. So you really wanna get those numbers ingrained in your head. But it's important to know that at those steeper angles, so 45, 60, or even greater, you're gonna have continuous steep sloughs coming off of steep slopes, which are small avalanches, but they're not those dangerous slab avalanches that we were just talking about, which are the ones that are most likely to catch you out. Okay, so the next element of terrain that we're gonna talk about is vegetation. So vegetation can influence how avalanches form, they can influence the, the consequence of being caught in an avalanche, and they can also give you clues about historical avalanche activity. So in this picture, we're looking at a, a zone of sparse trees. This is an example of trees that are sparse enough that an avalanche problem could form. And the other thing you'd wanna consider about terrain like this is that if an avalanche occurred in these trees and you were caught, it may significantly increase the trauma that you might have happened to you if you were caught in that avalanche, just from bouncing off trees, landing in tree wells, and things such as that. So now we're looking at an example of dense trees. And I just wanted to point out that this picture is in probably non-avalanche terrain because it's pretty much flat. But if this was on a slope, these trees would be too dense to create an avalanche problem. Um, the other thing to note about dense trees is that they can often be a terrain trap, which is something that I'm going to talk a little bit more in depth in with for a few in a few minutes. But if you were to get caught in an avalanche and get dragged into those dense trees, similar to the sparse tree idea, it could really increase trauma in that situation. So just something to keep in mind. So now we're gonna talk about the third piece of our puzzle, which is, which is us, it's triggers. So we're talking about us as humans out on our snowshoes, out on our skis, hiking or riding our sleds. 
whatever it is that you like to do in the backcountry. Um, humans are a very effective trigger. In fact, humans traveling through avalanche terrain are the most common triggers of avalanches when people are caught. So the thing to take from that is that often it's us, whether it's you yourself triggering an avalanche and getting caught or someone in your party triggering that avalanche and then you subsequently being caught in it. A couple other examples that we can think of for triggers would be cornices, which you can see in the top right of this photo, rocks falling off cliffs, snow that's falling from trees or cliffs, um, and explosives, which can be used to artificially create avalanches. So we've got a bit of a mix of both natural triggers and artificial triggers in this list. Other common triggers is gonna be just the weather around us. So we're talking about snowfall, wind moving that snow around, having warm weather or strong sunny days. So this is gonna be most likely when it's storming. So when it's actively snowing or there's, it's windy or when we have those nice warm sunny days where the sun's coming out and that's causing natural avalanche activity. And here is just a really quick anima animation to sum up what we've learned. Um, ultimately, all three of these things are needed to create an avalanche. Uh, and without them, we just wouldn't have avalanche activity. So the next element that I wanna discuss about terrain, which I alluded to a little bit a few slides earlier, is terrain traps. So terrain traps are described as a terrain feature that increases the consequence of an avalanche. Basically, if there's something about the terrain that makes the outcome of an avalanche worse than if it wasn't there, then you're looking at a terrain trap. So what does that mean? What, what's an example? An example of terrain traps would be on the left here where we're looking at cliffs that you could potentially get swept off if you're caught in an avalanche, a gully that might result in a deeper burial than if it were just on a, a normal planar slope, trees like we're seeing on the right here that like we discussed earlier could cause trauma, sharp finishes to a slope. So what I mean by that is a slope that has an abrupt transition into flat terrain crevasses on a glacier if you are traveling in glaciated terrain, as well as creeks. So if you were caught in an avalanche down into a creek, that could result in a deeper burial because of the steep walls of the creek, as well as like a, a bunch of other complications such as hypothermia or drowning um, if you were to be immersed under that water. So the next concept in terms of terrain is gonna be talking about overhead hazard. So overhead hazard, as the name alludes to, is literally the terrain that is above you. When we talk about overhead hazard, we're referring to the terrain above you that contains hazard that have potential to reach you if it were to release. So what are examples of overhead hazard? A big one that we can see right off the bat in this picture are these big cornices hanging over this ridge line. If those were to release, you can imagine that those cornices are massive. They're probably the size of a house um, in some instances and, and definitely the size of a car. So that's a lot of mass coming down onto you. Another example would be rock coming off cliffs or ice. Um, avalanches certainly are an overhead hazard. So like I was saying earlier, if you're exposed to slopes that are above you, that can be an overhead hazard. And then another big one, especially with how many people are getting out in the backcountry these days and how busy it can be, is other people. So thinking about where other groups are traveling and if they pose any threat to you and the party that you're out with. The best piece of advice that I can give you is to avoid exposure to overhead hazard whenever it's possible or to minimize the number of people exposed as well as the duration of their exposure when avoidance isn't possible. And so here's another example of overhead hazard and 
I just like this photo because it points out that it doesn't have to be this really big, massive face above you. It can be relatively small terrain, but you can see that these cornices above the sweater are huge. And if those were to release, they would definitely injure this person if they happen to be underneath them at the same time. So this is an example of where you might spread out, go one at a time, and only expose one person to the hazard whenever possible. So here is one more example where a ski tour is entering an area with overhead hazard. So how can we figure this out? The first one and the most obvious thing to do would be to look up. So we can see some big cornices, probably some avalanche slopes above them. And then the other kind of more subtle thing that you'll start to pick up on is vegetation clues. So we can see that these slopes below have really young sparse trees and that's probably a result of avalanches running down onto those slopes and taking out the trees in the path. The other vegetation clue, which is super interesting, is if you look on the right side of this photo, you can see that all the tree branches are broken off of the side of this tree. And you'll see that on the uphill of trees where tree branches are all broken off and it looks like someone's just gone and, and picked every branch off. That's a result of avalanches running down and pulling those branches off. So whenever you see trees that have branches broken off or they're leaning downhill, it's most likely that they've been impacted by avalanches and you're in fact in an avalanche runout zone. So now that we understand the hazard that avalanches pose, the next question is how do we manage risk in avalanche terrain? So this slide is really an introduction to risk and risk management. So here we're looking at Sunshine Village Ski Resort where I actually used to work in the Rockies. Um, in this area, the avalanche hazard is managed by ski patrollers and by ski hill staff. So when you're traveling here, they are managing hazard for you. Over on the left here, we're looking at avalanche paths that, in, that are impacted, avalanche roads that are impacted by avalanche paths above. So here, this is controlled by Parks Canada and the Ministry of Transportation generally. So when you're traveling on those roads, you can know that you're safe from avalanche terrain. And then here in the red, we have our unmanaged backcountry. And that's really what we're going to be focusing on here. So highway operations are responsible for minimizing avalanche risk to drivers. Um, there's a few methods that this is done. Um, to know about this, you should check highway closures that are shown on Drive BC. Um, you should understand the managing protocol. So often you'll see those signs that say no stopping avalanche train. So those are used to manage the risk. Um, they use engineered structures and they also use active control using explosives. And this would be an example. Uh, hopefully it's not too laggy this video, but this is an example of avalanche control using explosives above a highway. So this is why it's really important to pay attention to those closures um, and, and follow instructions from Drive BC because they're they're trying to keep us safe. And then again, this is going to looking at a ski hill operation. Ski resorts manage our risk by controlling avalanche terrain prior to opening it to the public. But it's important to know that some areas may re remain permanently closed due to high risk. And that's not necessarily just avalanches. And this is a pretty common thing to see um, right off the ski hill is a ski area boundary telling you that you are leaving and heading into the back country. And it's really important to know that even when you're just off the ski hill in what people sometimes refer to as the slack country, you are in unmanaged avalanche terrain. It is totally on you to manage your own risk and to take, take responsibility for that. And here's another video. It's an example of a ski patroller deploying a hand charge to create an avalanche. So that's how they generally control avalanches within ski area boundaries.
And then again, there's a video of a helicopter flying over top and deploying explosives to create an avalanche. And so everywhere else off these highways and out of these ski hills, everything, everywhere else is on us. And this is the back country. It's your responsibility for understanding where you're at risk and how to effectively reduce the risk. So oftentimes when you go to popular trailheads, you'll see these signs um, that are telling you you are entering avalanche terrain. And they also have sometimes what's called an ACE map, which is a, a mapping system to to tell recreationalists what type of avalanche terrain they might be traveling in, all the way from zero to four, zero being non-avalanche terrain, and four being your complicated, convoluted, really challenging avalanche terrain. So that can be a great tool. And if you head to avalanche.ca and look under the resources tab, you can get to our trip planner, which will map out popular riding areas in an eight system for you. And that really is a great tool for people starting out in the backcountry. But oftentimes there is going to be no signs to tell you you're entering the backcountry. So when it's left to us, let's come back to it. What do you use to know that you're in avalanche terrain when signs aren't posted? So the first one that we talked about already is vegetation clues. Am I in a big open slope with no trees? Or am, am, am I in an open meadow when I was just previously in a very dense forest? If I look up, can I see that there's big steep slopes above me or overhead hazard? Another thing you can do prior to heading out in the field or out in the field if you have a cloudy day and you can't really see what's around you is looking at maps. I always have a map with me on my smartphone um, using a GPS signal. Um, and it's also smart to carry a paper map to be able to look at the map and identify potential steep avalanche terrain within your planned travel route. And then as you're out in the field, the biggest thing that you can do is again, evaluate those slopes around you. So coming back to that slope angle, knowing if you are in avalanche terrain, if you are exposed to avalanche terrain by understanding what slopes are steep enough to slide. So now what? Segwaying away from terrain a little bit, we're going to talk about some more resources that are available to you as a backcountry user to help educate yourself on the current conditions. So I'm going to come back to talking about our flagship product, which are the public avalanche forecasts. Uh, this has changed a little bit this year, and we've introduced what we call the flexible forecast regions. So these regions that you see on the map, they're gonna change based on weather and snowpack conditions creating avalanche danger instead of having a set regional boundary. So a really important way for you to interact with this map is knowing where you're gonna be riding. And that could either mean that you zoom in to the mountains that you're heading to, or the easiest way is gonna be using this search bar on the top left corner and searching the area you're going to. We have over 200,000 place names currently in this search bar, and that varies from everything from popular riding areas to the name of mountains, backcountry huts, lakes. We've tried to kind of cover a broad range there. Uh, so most riding areas should be available there, and it's gonna zoom you right into where you need to be and which avalanche forecast you need to be looking at. So read the forecasts, learn about danger ratings, avalanche problems, and terrain travel advice, and you can get some more detailed avalanche information on the specific region that you're traveling to for that day. So this is what essentially what the sub-regions look like within this regional, um, this flexible forecast system. So this is how it's broken down into a bunch of different regions based on popular riding areas based on climactic factors. Um, and then we create use these to create avalanche forecasts for the given day and specific regions for that given day. And new to the landing page, which is awesome, is a snowshoes page. And this talks about understanding the forecast, terrain, avalanche condition and recognition, 
signs of instability, and some links to some really helpful tutorials as well. So this is a great place to start if you're new to the backcountry and you want a great introduction that's well laid out for you. All right, so Sandra alluded to the fact that we we're gonna talk about specific gear that you might use when you're heading out in the backcountry. If you are going out, everyone in your group needs to be carrying these things. The first one being an avalanche transceiver. Essentially a transceiver is a small electronic device that you're gonna wear close to your body and it's gonna send out a signal. And that signal allows people to find you if you were buried in an avalanche. So that needs to be on send and you need to check that everyone's transceivers are sending before you head out. Um, and another key thing is that it needs to be a modern digital three antenna transceiver. That's the standard and it's gonna make sure that people are able to find you as fast as possible. Our next piece of equipment is an avalanche probe. Transceivers will get you close to a buried victim by following a signal, but the probe is really going to be what helps you find them. Probes are um, quite delicate and they snap together kind of like a tent pole wid to assemble them. Um, and it allows you to systematically probe into the snow uh, to, to feel where that person is buried. Um, they're a super important piece of kit. And it's recommended that you have a probe that's at least three meters long to be able to find someone in a deeper deposit. So again, having a probe and making sure that it's long enough is important. And our last important piece of kit is gonna be a shovel. Just like a transceiver and a probe, this is a super essential tool. Uh, and actually something that's kind of under practice, I would say. Um, it sounds funny to practice your shoveling technique, but Research has shown that the certain method of shoveling, a conveyor method of shoveling is the most effective. And in early season right now, when maybe the riding's not that great or the snow conditions aren't so good for snowshoeing, it's a great time to practice shoveling as a group and make sure that you can do that um, really as effectively as possible so that when it comes down to it, it's more of a reflex than anything else. And then the last thing I wanted to talk about is um, the Avi Savvy tool on Avalanche Canada's website. So this is our online Avalanche tutorial, and it's an easy to navigate tool that basically brings you through all the steps that you might need to know when you're first starting out an avalanche terrain. Um, yeah, it's a great program, super user friendly, and definitely something to check out. And then after you go to Abby Savvy, the kind of next step that you'd want to be looking into would be basic movement skills on your sled or skis, which um, is got which you can get through experience. And then taking an AST course, so an avalanche skills tour of course, the first one being your AST one. And what you're going to learn in these courses at, on, in broad terms is how avalanches form, where they form proper techniques for trip planning, how to interpret available resources, such as the avalanche bulletin, how to safely travel through terrain, and how to get good at companion rescue. So in summary, we need to be able to recognize what makes avalanche terrain. We need to be able to understand conditions when or where avalanches are possible, be aware of the risks and whose responsibility they are, know how to be prepared, know where to access information. So that's talking about the avalanche forecasts and digging into those forecasts and keep yourself informed. And this is such a classic adage that you, you're gonna hear a lot through your avalanche safety learning. Um, when snow is the problem, terrain is the answer. So, that really comes back to why this is such a fundamental thing to learn about what is avalanche terrain. Your first step in keeping yourself safe is being able to identify avalanche terrain and manage it or avoid it, depending on what your goals are in the backcountry.
And that is all I have for you guys tonight. I'm going to pass it back over to Sandra here, and I'm happy to take any questions. Oh, yeah. Hey, there's Chloe. Chloe. Okay, great. Oh, I got some feedback there. You go ahead, Scott. Yeah, I think the feedback's on Zoe's side. So we'll oh. just... Do you want me to mute myself for a second? Here? Yeah, just for just for a second while we're chatting until it catches up. So, well, first of all, thank you, obviously. Uh, wonderful information, lots of great questions coming in. Thank you very much for uh, putting in these questions. A lot of them came right at the last minute, which uh, uh, just trying to keep me on my toes. Uh, I'm gonna go ahead and start off with uh, answering a question that someone asked by doing a poll. Now, Sandra doesn't know what this poll is. She said I could surprise her with a poll. So we'll see whether or not she actually has the ability to get this poll correct. And it does answer a question, I believe it was by Oren. So Avalanche Canada has something called the Mountain Information Network. The Mountain Information Network brings together reports from all mountain users, including the public, on snow conditions, avalanches, and incidents like near misses and fatalities across Canada. The first report of this season, I looked it up, came in on October 25th. And the snow conditions, it was about snow conditions on Ray Glacier and Kananaskis. So my poll question, which I will first ask uh, Sandra to see whether or not she can get it right, because she doesn't know what this one is, is how many reports have been received by the Mountain Information Network so far this season? So the first one was on October 25th. So go ahead and vote in that poll. And while you're voting, I'm gonna ask Sandra to tell us what she thinks it is. I just watched one of the Avcan reps talk. I don't think it was you, Zoe. There was a great little thing and it talked exactly about this and I'm trying to remember. I'm glad you put the numbers there because my, my guess initially was much lower than these. So it's one of these, eh, Scott? So, um, yeah, the, the, I... it, it, to be clear, this is all the different kinds of reports. So it's not just incidences. It's incidences plus uh, snow reports. So a person goes up on the mountain and, and, and they observe that the conditions are in a particular manner or they saw an avalanche that occurred and they reported it. So how many of those are in the system right now? Already as of October 25th, I'm going to go 382. Interesting. Zoe, do you happen to have an idea? Oh gosh, I should have watched that little video that Sandra's talking about. Um, but I think she's I think she's right. If I had to guess, I think it would be close to 382. Well, it's actually been more. So let's look at the number here. 468 people so far. That might have changed in the last few minutes, but it was just before this thing I double checked. 468 people so far have gone in and reported avalanches and such. And the reason I wanted to bring that up front is Oren actually asked a question. Does avalanche.ca have a recent known avalanches? So Zoe, do you want to talk a little bit more about the Mountain Information Network? Yeah, absolutely. That's a really great segue into talking about the Mountain Information Network. So Avalanche Canada is the place where people come to when they observe avalanches, um, whether that be through the Mountain Information Network or, or other channels. Um, and we try to get that information out to the public in the best way that we can. So that's through the avalanche forecasts, but a big way is just through people sharing information through the Mountain Information Network. So we really encourage people to share information on the Mountain Information Network, both for our forecasts and for other recreationalists. And what it is, is a way of sharing your observations for the day in a kind of quick, concise format. So you log on to avalanche.ca, you go to the Mountain Information Network, and you're just gonna give a summary of what your day was, what you saw. If you did see any significant avalanche activity, we really appreciate it if you're able to be transparent and to show, share that with everyone, because there's often a lot to be learned for everyone, and it could really help someone else um, not get caught in an avalanche or not have an incident. So it's a, it's just a way of sharing information between recreationalists and professionals, basically. Marvelous, thank you. 
uh, when let's go back to another question this is a question that four people asked so obviously we need to get an answer to it what app or apps do you use you were referring to an app that would tell you what the angle is so what app or apps you know what we can go ahead and 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 uh, pro, uh, promote a particular app. Don't worry about that. If you happen to want it to, for, for uh, uh, Android and Apple. I think the app I use is literally just called Inclinometer. Um, it's a really basic app. You open it and it right away just shows you slope angle as you tilt it. Um, but there's plenty out there. They're generally free, which is awesome. But if you just type in Inclinometer into the app store, it'll probably show up. And just to elaborate a little bit on how I measure that slope angle, usually what I do is I take my ski pole, because it's a nice straight edge. I'll put my ski pole against the slope, and then I'll put my phone up against that ski pole to measure the, the slope angle. And I wasn't joking in saying that I do that pretty regularly, almost every time I go out. It's a bit of a game with friends, but it's really helped me to calibrate um, knowing what slope angle I'm on and, and, and knowing if I am an avalanche tree. That's perfect. Thank you very much. Um, the next question we're going to give you is from, um, is from uh, excuse me, Janet. Uh, Janet says once she saw a curly cue of a sort of uh, on uh, of snow on the uh, on the slope. I'm not sure if she's talking about a cornice or something else. You can maybe figure that one out. But there were several of them, and they were about three inches in diameter and about uh, ten or sorry three feet in diameter and about ten inches or so wide. Are these curly cues that you might see on a slope a sign of avalanche danger? And I don't know the answer to that. You know, the only thing that I can think of that she might be referring to might be like really wind affected snow. Sometimes mm. when you have wind traveling across a snow surface, it kind of leaves these waves and ripples in the snow. Um, that's not going to necessarily indicate that there is avalanche activity or that it is a dangerous place. It more so might be indicating that the wind has kind of grab snow from that location and maybe deposited it on a leaf feature, so on, a, on the other side of a roll or something, to create a wind slab avalanche, which is part of those dangerous slab avalanches. So I'm not sure if that answers your question, but I think what you might be looking at is wind affected snow there. Perfect. Uh, Madison asked us a question that was similar to Oren's, uh, where we talked about the Mountain Information Network, but I'm gonna extend on it a little bit. Madison asks, what is the best resource to understand local season snowpack history when visiting a new area? I think the Mountain Information Network would be what I would go to, but is there any other resource you might want to look at to figure out what the local season snowpack history is like? Probably your best point of um, for information is going to be the avalanche forecast. If you do head into our forecasts under the detail page, we have a snowpack summary which is going to be a broad picture summary of what the snowpack looks like, what layers in the snowpack are there, and, and kind of how it's shaped up throughout the season. So really, that's going to be your easiest and best resource for knowing that. Superb. Um, Anna wants to know, is there an ideal size of group or party to go out into the background? So in other words, like, what about solo skiing? Uh, versus me going out with my wife and my dog versus me going out with 20 of my friends? What's the right number? Yeah, that's a that's a really good question, Anna. That's awesome. Um, I, so ideally, you're heading out to the backcountry with e at least one other person, and, and that's for avalanche terrain, but also other safety concerns. There are times where you can head out solo into the backcountry, um, but for the most part, we recommend being with at least one other person and then in terms of the right number for a group, it really depends on what activity you're looking to do. I find that in terms of um, having good conversations and, and keeping everyone involved in the risk management, um, usually about two to five people use, usually ends up being a happy medium where you have good conversations, everyone's involved, and it's not too big of a group that you're kind of losing people's opinions or losing people's um, insight into what's happening. And sometimes when you get into those bigger groups, it gets a little bit hard to manage that many people. 
especially if you can imagine uh, a bunch of skiers on a slope, say, it gets hard to, to make sure that everyone is following safe travel practices and, and regrouping in the right places. It just ends up being a lot to think about. But there definitely are scenarios where it's totally fine to have you and 20 of your best friends. And it just, it just depends on what your objectives are for the day, I suppose. I, su I suspect I know the answer to this one, but I want to hear it from a professional because, uh, you know what, I'm not one of those. If you trigger an avalanche, hopefully by accident, uh, is it safe to ride the slab afterwards? So I think what this person probably means is if, if they trigger an avalanche, is it safe to ride down the slope after it has already avalanched? Ah, okay. And I think I think that's probably what they're getting to. So they would be riding down what we refer to as the bed surface of the avalanche, whereas the slab has already kind of failed and, and gone down the hill. Um, and I'm going to give the, the classic answer of it kind of depends. So it depends of if there's any other lingering overhead hazard or hazard on either side of where the avalanche has occurred or if there's any weaker layers down in the snowpack that could create an, another avalanche on top of that. Yeah, so, I could just imagine you you, you might, if, if you were the one who kicked off the slab moving down, that doesn't mean that above you, uh, there, there, it, that section of snow might not be ready to, might be ready to come down. In fact, now that there's no support, it may come down pretty quickly, right? Exactly, exactly, Scott. So you can still have what we call hang fire, which is little bits of that slab hanging above it that's now doesn't have much support and, and might fail. Um, so it, it really depends. And I hate to give a wishy-washy answer like that, but no, but it's that's like my opinion on that. everything is different, right? No matter where you are, that's one of the things I was thinking about. I had that picture you saw earlier with me uh, uh, snowshoeing with my wife and my dog, right? And at that point in time, in that part of the trail, all I could see is a cliff and it's like a 90 degree cliff there right uh on my right and it's sort of a 90 degree degree cliff on the left and the trail is you know, maybe about uh, uh four or five feet wide i don't know what's above me and i do look at the map i do try and look at the map and see whether or not that the, the if it's really really cl the uh, the top of lines are close together or they're far apart or they're spaced in just the wrong place uh, but sometimes it's really hard and you just don't know what you're passing through uh, for short periods, right? Like if I was doing that for a long period, it's not, but if I was doing it for 10, minutes, 10 feet, I might just risk it just trying to get through that area, right? Totally. And that's really where understanding what slope angle is great enough to create an avalanche is important, as well as those safe travel habits. So if you are exposing yourself to avalanche terrain or possibly even if you can't see, having those safe travel habits, only exposing one person at a time and um, spacing out across slopes. Travis is curious as to what the risk of avalanches are inbounds at resort on the steepest runs. Now you said the steepest runs are about the, 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 the 45 degree angle. Is it virtually zero or should you actually be trying to like think about the possibility of an avalanche when you're in a resort inbounds? Uh, so uh, ski resorts, yes, they try to create zero avalanche hazard inbounds. Um, obviously, it's not a perfect science. We're, we're doing our best to control every little hazard, but um, we are prepared for, for the unexpected, which would be an avalanche inbound. So, so to answer your question, uh, yes, we are trying to create zero hazard inbounds, but um, there may be instances where avalanches occur inbounds. So Michelle has an interesting question, and I th I'll read the question for sure. But I think this is a great opportunity to talk about further training because this isn't this isn't the end all and be all of training, right? We're gonna you talked about there's avalanche skills courses, uh, etc. So this is a great example of a question that might lead to that. If one was accidentally caught in a slab avalanche, are there any techniques for survival? that you could use while being pushed by the slab. Now, I don't want you to necessarily go into an AST1 course and have us here for the next eight hours, but let's talk about what those next options are if we want to do it and where we would be able to find out information on going to get that kind of information. 
Yeah, that's a really good direction to steer this question in Scott. So what Scott's alluding to is um, that's something that you're going to hear pretty comprehensively about in your avalanche safety training. So, so as I kind of touched on in the slides there, the next step really is to get an EST1, which is your avalanche safety training one course. And that course is going to go over all of those good things. Really, if you are caught in a slab avalanche, the the one adage that they kind of tell you is to try to swim to the surface. So um, as if you were underwater, you're trying to keep yourself above the surface of the of the snow and, and stay, stay above the mass, which is easier said than done, I would say. We're running out of runway here, uh, but I did want to bring up something because this actually, we talked about this in a, a previous uh, meeting and I think it's important to recognize it here as well. Um, we have avalanche transceivers and we showed them there and then i've also noticed that in my coat i have a reco device does that mean i don't need an avalanche transceiver no so reco devices um they really are more of a body recovery system than an avalanche rescue tool uh they are they definitely do not replace an avalanche head transceiver it is a good thing if you have one because they can be used in search and rescue practices, but they are certainly not um, a substitute for avalanche transceivers. And I'm fairly certain, I don't, uh, uh, we were talking about this the other day, I don't think there's any search and rescue team that has a RECO uh, uh, search system. So uh, like you said, it might be something that happens afterwards, but I don't think any of the teams have them on their on their on this thing when they're going out and they're trying to probe for people. They don't have any reco uh, equipment with them. Totally. Uh, Sandra, I think we're running out of runway here. I, my That's apologies okay. to Jordan, and there was a couple more people who had a few more questions, but uh, I do also want to keep an eye on our time because we did say it would only be an hour. Uh, and I know a lot of you were hanging around so that you could potentially um, maybe get a prize. And we're going to see if we can do that. Well, I think they were really hanging around to listen to Zoe, but the prize is a bonus. That's, that's the icing on the cake. Zoe well, that's the, re that's the reason they continue to listen to me, right? <laughs> <laughs> you're right. You're right. All, all to get to, uh, to what's really important, which was Zoe this evening. Zoe, that was awesome. You know, I've seen that presentation a few times. I participated on Avcan's uh, webinars as a guest, so really appreciate um, you joining us on ours. And it's really great to hang out with our cousins, uh, industry cousins. I really think we we can complement each other, and we're really here for all the public, aren't we? We're here for everyone to go out there and enjoy the snow and slide, however, wherever, on whatever they like to slide on, and reach their destination. And their destination is always, always home. So everything that you provided tonight was spot on, and, and I'm really grateful for that. Um, NSR, Scott, has uh, one of those large RECO devices that hangs from the helicopter. So that's, uh, that's one SAR group out of the 78 that does have that capability. Um, but great answer to that question, So we Thank you for just being very clear on what that is and isn't. Let's get into that skill testing question. We have one minute, and we love to keep on time here. Get your fingers ready. You get to type in the answer, and Scott is the eyes. He's watching as you answer the skill testing question. Sorry, Zoe, you can't participate, but you can watch and, and enjoy the fun. Um, so we talked about a lot tonight, and this question is around one of the pieces, and it's a piece that involves you, and it, it's a piece that helps Avalanche Canada, and it's a piece that we had in our poll question this evening. Thanks, Scott. Can you tell us what the acronym MIN stands for? Type that in, the first person wins a beautiful pair of trail crampons from Hill Sound Equipment, and we will have those sent to you as soon we, as we can. We had one person who typed a little too quickly, didn't get it out, but the first person who got it out correctly was Ray from New Brunswick, I think, if I'm reading that right. Wow. So, Ray, uh, those crampons uh, might be heading your way. Uh, I'm going to just uh, send you a quick note, and you can double check that this is the email that uh, we need to send you information on. Oh, that's awesome. Thanks for playing our game. And if I'm right in reading, because I know my notes here show different because I'm an uh, organizer and paddleist, I'm pretty sure we had people join us tonight from New Brunswick. Thank you. 
Um, and we also had from north and southern parts of British Columbia, Florida, and the Cayman Islands. We've had people come from all over the place. So I'm assuming you're down there in sunny, warm Cayman, um, where I've had the pleasure to visit once. Beautiful. Thank you. And thanks to everyone for joining us tonight. We have more of these coming out. The next one's this Thursday. It's all about backcountry snow safety, a little bit more of an intro to our three T's, trip planning, training, taking the essentials, basic backcountry awareness, decision-making, situational awareness, and we have an avalanche skills training course to give away this Thursday. And then we all take a break for Christmas. We come back in the new year. You know where to find all of our webinars and uh, sign up for whatever one fills your, uh, fills your interest. Thanks again, Zoe. Say hi to everyone in Avalanche Canada's office there in Revy. Scott, it's always a pleasure. Appreciate your support. And thanks to everyone for getting informed before you go outdoors. You are helping search and rescue and reducing the number and severity of those calls. Take care. Good night. Take care. Thanks again, Zoe. Yeah, thanks so much for tuning in, everyone.